All right. All right. Are we ready for blast off? Michael, how's it going? Good. Very good. Okay, welcome everybody who was just at the premiere about nature journaling the Arenal volcano. Luckily, we're here with Mike, and Mike is a Patreon uh, supporter of the Nature Journal Show and also has a pretty good understanding of some of the geological concepts and is an amateur uh, geologist and is going to help us look at some of the ways we can um, improve our nature journaling of volcanoes. Welcome to the show, Mike. Hello. Hello, everybody. All right, great. So well, I, here's I the. I'm going to talk. I, I'm not a real yes. geologist. And I was a. Uh, I, I was a, uh, a physicist and a computer scientist in another life, so I have some some of the educational background for it, and I, I have like part of a part of an undergraduate program in geology, I guess, something I've been doing lately. Yes. So I understand the basic you, but you know, a and you're a nature journaler. So this is a good this is this will be a good start. So I'm going to kind of give an overview here. Um, make sure people make sure you have some stuff to sketch with because we are going to try to make this participatory to some degree and not just too much talking. Um, really grateful for for Mike to be here. What we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of nature journaling, a little bit of sketching from photos. We're going to talk about what are some of the good questions that we can be asking. What are what's some of the basic knowledge about volcanoes? that is necessary, why volcanoes are an interesting topic for nature journaling, a little bit about geology, um, and, and some resources for how you can nature journal volcanoes even without um, necessarily going um, to them. So hopefully that um, gives you a little bit of an idea of where we're going to go with this. But Mike, how about this? I'm going to put a photo up here. Um, we're going to look at a photo of a volcano. People can get their nature journal um, supplies out. I'll get my nature journal supplies out. We'll do sort of like a quick little bit of nature journaling. And then maybe you can, um, while we're looking at this photo, maybe you can give us some sort of uh, insights into what we're seeing and maybe some questions of what we should be asking. Does that sound good to you? Sure. Sure. Okay. And so for people who are watching this live or who are watching this later in the recorded version, go ahead and, and type some comments in about any questions that you have. Um, what are some things that you, questions that you have about nature journaling volcanoes and i'll set things up here to um share uh my screen so this uh this and... chat is a little different than what i'm used to it has a it has a private chat header and a comments header it looks like there's a lot correct of... okay there's a lot of stuff in so comments. the private chat is it, the private chat is the one for you to tell me if i have a booger in my nose and uh -huh. for me to fix that without everybody else um finding out about it and then the comments, uh, you can look there if if you want, but usually what I do with the guests is I'll um, help deal with that part and then sort of field the comments to you. But I think in this one, go ahead and there will be times when I might be um, even more busy than you looking at that stuff. And so uh, go ahead and check that out there. I can't remember if you're allowed to, to, to respond to them directly. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing look, my screen here. It doesn't look like I have a response area here. Okay. But we'll yeah. Okay, great. So let's start here. Let's start with this image here. And I actually think there's one person in the audience who's going to be very familiar with this location. But um, how, can you see can you see these volcanoes here, Michael? In the uh, in the cones in the distance? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is let me get this. Um, I think we can make this big. Oops. All right, let's just work with it at this size here. Um, and what we're gonna do is get your nature journal supplies out. And um, what we're gonna do is, what do you think, what do you think, maybe post in the comments, people, what do you think would be a nature journaling approach? One of our nature journaling techniques to get you started um, if you were in this location looking at this, um, this view. And maybe, Mike, since you're on, um, on with me here. What and and you're a nature journaler too. What would you? How would you start um, if you were in this location and had this view? What nature journaling technique would you start with? Um, I think I would look at these uh, interesting rocks in, in the in the lower left hand corner. I oh uh, I might not be able to identify them, but they they look like 
they could be basalt or they could be andesite which is a kind of dark okay material so all right I, well, I, I was gonna I would be looking at these these are really really interesting to me okay let's do that because i i like that um maybe we can start uh i mean we would normally start with some metadata so you might want i'll, I'll give a little bit of contextual information this is in baja california mexico and um let's do i was gonna i was gonna suggest we do a landscape ito but i like that mike is sort of leading us in a different direction so maybe create a little square on your page i'm gonna create um i just wrote baja california for my uh metadata and that's it for now and maybe write that we're is a youtube video that you're not actually there um and i'm gonna start with a small square and maybe get a little sketch. I was going to say landscape Ito, but I like where Mike is uh, leading us here. And these rocks are way closer at hand than the cones in the background. So let's go ahead. And if you're watching this live, let us know in the comments what oh, nature yeah. journaling technique you would start with. Okay, so what are some questions we should be asking about these these rocks, like what are the kinds of things we should be looking for? Uh, I would, uh, I would be looking at color. If I, if I was thinking about geology. Um, okay. Yeah. Geologists have, have a hard time identifying rocks in the field. What they like to do is uh, they like to slice and section, but there are, there are techniques for figuring out what, what kind of rock you have. I would want to look. Okay. So really really closely get up really close to those rocks and look at the grain size can i see anything in there okay can all I right see what metal? is the grain size could you talk about that a little bit more this is so, this is uh, the kind of stuff that we need to know to nature journal volcanoes so so igneous rocks these are um rocks that that, that come about from some kind of melting process uh, are made up of uh, uh various minerals and which minerals show up tells you what kind of uh, what kind of volcanic process took place. A, a rock that has a lot of uh, silicon in it, a, a lot of tiny little, little little looks like little pieces of, of uh, broken glass, very very small pieces for uh, volcanic rocks. That's that's usually um, that's that kind of lava didn't flow very much wherever it came from is usually fairly close a really dark really really dark rock like the basalts that we saw in the galapagos or that you see in mm -hmm. hawaii those are those are lava flows that might have that might be tens of miles long and those volcanoes as a result have, have, get this enormous cover this enormous territory like Mauna Loa that's erupting right now. okay great so, so like could you help me uh could you help with three things here I noticed that you mentioned sort of three um spectra uh or three continuums um from one is darkness um from a dark yeah. dark colored rocks to to light colored rocks Another one is uh, steepness of volcanoes, from steep volcanoes to flat volcanoes, and then you also maybe the third one was sort of from silicon-based um, rocks to basalt rocks. Could you sort of explain yeah. those? Um... They're they're kind of they're kind of interlocked. They're they're uh, they're reasons why the, they're reasons why they're interlocked. So. Rocks mm -hmm. with a very, all rocks have a lot of silicon in them. That's an okay. enormous constituent part of the crust and the mantle of the earth. But rocks that have a lot of silicon in them, like granites you see in the Sierra, or um, the kind of rocks that come out of these um, uh, the typical, typical volcanoes in, say, uh, uh, Costa Rica or the Andes, they have... Right. Uh, they have a lot of silicon in them. They tend the rocks tend to be lighter colored, but 
oxidation and other things can change that. And they also have other minerals in them. So is this right here Dark. what I'm putting up to the camera? Silicon? Silicon, right. And so that's wow. so that's silicon in, a, in an unusual state. Uh, it's a state called glass. And people may be familiar with obsidian. Obsidian is also a product of volcanoes like the volcanoes you see in, in Costa Rica or the Andes or the Cascades in, Calif in California and the Pacific Northwest. And obsidian is a, 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 another glass, very high silicon content with a lot of impurities in it, iron usually, some other minerals. So it's a darker color typically. So we think of glass as being stable. It's chemically not stable. It eventually mm. will hydrate and, and kind of turn into a, a sort of a spongy sand. So it's, a, it's it, it, you know, there, there are no... There, there are no 200 million year old obsidian rocks. It doesn't last that long. So over really? over geologic time, it's not really stable. But we think of it as stable. Like glass is, whoa, that's going to be around forever. So in our in our lifespans, it is. But in geology lifespans, it's 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 a, a very fragile material. It eventually breaks down. Uh, the the darker colors which you see in these rocks uh, here in the lower left are probably uh, iron content and magnesium content, probably. The other thing that's often, um, uh, that's often in volcanic rocks uh, are minerals from aluminum. Those are the feldspars. So they bind up with some silicon, some aluminum, and assorted other uh assorted other atoms calcium uh, sodium magnesium potassium the lightest of these are the uh, potassium feldspars the that's the the they have a kind of pinkish cast and that gives uh, granite its kind of pale pinkish look it's different than the red that comes from a, a high iron content sometimes, like we've seen in a couple places in the Galapagos. And you probably uh, you probably see that some places in, in Costa Rica too. Does that help? So that's Got that's it. the chemistry. The chemistry yes. stuff is really is really interesting, but it's it's kind of complicated. What happens with chemistry? You get uh, lava that melts at high temperatures. Those are those mm -hmm. are the iron based ones that basalt is a hot lava that's why it's able to flow and then with more the the more silicon that's in there you have a, a lava that can melt at a lower temperature but it for various reasons it doesn't flow very well it's very sticky so silic the the light okay. colored silicon based lavas don't flow and they okay. often okay. are associated uh, with explosions for that reason okay cool all right so um, what I'm going to, to mention here for people who are trying to nature journal along with this, um, definitely check the live chat. There's some good, um, some good comments on ideas of how to approach this, this scene from a nature journaling perspective. One thing I want to point out is that if you're tuning into this live, this is going to be more of a combination of sketch noting and nature journaling, um, because we're hearing a lot of information from Mike. And one of the things we might want to do is, is capture that in sort of note taking form. One of the things you can see here is I have several of these sort of um, basically like their spectra. They're trying to show sort of this, you know, a gradient from a steep volcano to a flat volcano or a gradient from a high temperature to a low temperature. So this is something I talk about a lot, but a lot of things in nature and in reality are on a spectrum. They're not like black or white. So figuring out ways to represent that visually, whether you're note taking um, or trying to 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 conceptualize something in the real world that you're seeing, that's super useful. And then multiple people have mentioned um, using a landscape veto, zooming in on the rocks. I love that um, Mike had us a look at the rocks. I just did a quick sketch of the rocks here. And obviously a landscape veto would be another useful one. We're gonna um, move on 
from now, but I just wanted to warm us up with Actually, this. Actually, I, um, I have a image. question about that picture that, that occurred okay. to me while I was yes. while I was blabbering away. Can you show the picture again? Yes. So yep. this this looks like uh, we're sitting on top of a like a butte or a, a hill. Is Correct. it another one of is it another one of these uh, little peaks? It absolutely is. And here, maybe um, it's a little bit spread out more in this photo, but this oh, yeah. is more of a panorama shot. And in this, um, ideally, I would have like a Google Earth thing connected to this, but we are, I believe, on another one of these um, volcanoes um, at this location. And my friend Adam is here, who is actually the one that took me along on this trip. It was a little science expedition to this location in Baja, California where I'm hoping to do some more nature journaling again this year, but I have some videos of nature journaling there. And we are on another one of the peaks at the end of a sand spit. It's a really cool, narrow sand spit that connects this volcano that we're standing on with those ones uh, in the distance. I believe that island out there um, in the ocean is also another one. So uh, an right. incredible landscape just from an aesthetic point of view. All right, we're going to keep going here with the, um, the agenda and um we're gonna do some more sketching and nature journaling in a second but what i wanted to do is make sure you post any of the questions you have about nature journaling volcanoes um in the comments that would be awesome um and actually let me just let's maybe we can answer this question right now uh mike what do you think about this uh, uh I, I don't think that's fair to volcanoes or pimples they're, re they're okay. really different processes um all right, really? so analogic thinking has a uh, has its limits. It has its limits. Thanks for yeah. bringing that up, though, Adam. Um, that is a good one. All right, so um, the things I wanted to address uh, quickly here at the beginning are um, why should we nature journal volcanoes? One of the reasons why, and this is a vocabulary word for today, is abiotic. So a lot of times in the nature journal community, there's this association or assumption that um, nature is – um, plants and animals. It's living things, plants, animals, mushrooms, lichens, things like that. But don't forget, there is so much of nature. The major If you look at it from the universal perspective, the majority of nature is abiotic. So the way water boils, the way clouds form, the way stars uh, move or explode, um, all of those things, gravity, all of that stuff is nature. And I think that a lot of times we forget this because of the connotation that nature has. So let us as nature journalers who are trying to be more intentional, um, let, let us not be the ones to commit this error and to forget that nature is abiotic as well. So that's number one, abiotic. Number two um, about volcanoes is they're exciting. Volcanoes are exciting. So if you normally aren't excited about nature journaling abiotic things, volcanoes are probably the most exciting thing you could do. So uh, volcanoes represent geology and so much of the important aspects of nature on this planet are geological. So those are definitely reasons to nature journal them. And then another one I think is that it's pushing the envelope of nature journaling. So how can we, and this is something that I'm committed to, is how can we see nature journaling pushing the envelope? So as much as I love the um, di the nature diaries of the Edwardian lady, what was her name again, Mike? I, for I forgot Brenda, thanks. Edith, Edith Holden. Edith Holden. So as much as I love, thanks to Brenda for having that um, on hand. Um, so as much as I love Edith Holden, and especially at that time, this was revolutionary. Um, we can go even beyond this today um, and push the envelope with nature journaling. And so, you know, there's been some of these recent volcanic eruptions and we've got people photographing them. We've got people flying drones over them, getting video. There's journalists there. Are there any nature journalers there? How cool would it be to um, nature journal volcanoes? So next is how can we nature journal volcanoes? Um, well, there are some ways for you to nature journal volcanoes, even if you don't go to them, but I'll talk about that in a second. So for example, there is an amazing, I'm going to recommend another YouTube channel here and I'll post it in the comments, but, um, there is an amazing YouTube channel called geology hub. There's a lot of trashy YouTube channels that show volcano stuff. So watch out for those, but there's a channel called geology hub. 
and they post actual like intelligent stuff about volcanoes. And I would definitely recommend that um, channel. They have multiple um, volcano videos. Sorry, I'm in an urban area. I am in San Jose, Costa Rica. I don't have control over the sounds here. Um, I highly recommend this channel called Geology Hub on YouTube. They have multiple videos and they have a live cam of the um, eruption in Hawaii right now. So uh, check that channel out. Um, and then a couple things um, to be aware of when nature drilling from videos. Just I'm going to just give a couple things really quickly here. Tips and pitfalls for nature journaling from videos. Make sure you use metadata. So here I, I, I didn't do very much, but um, I've seen some people do very good jobs of this. Kate Rudder, who was here a moment ago and perhaps is still here. Um, I've seen her uh, metadata when she's watching a video. Uh, multiple other people um, do a good job of creating a metadata um, entry on their nature journal page showing that they're watching a video. So if you're nature journaling from a video of a volcano, that's very different from nature journaling from volcano in real life. And please write something on your page distinguishing between those two um, just to make it clear, especially if you're going to post it later on so people know that you're not at that volcano. Um, next is be objective about not being objective. So the same thing is if, if you're looking at it from a video or from a photo, let us, let us know, write it down in the metadata. Um, let yourself know. Be critical and engaged as you would be in real life. So if you're watching a video on YouTube, uh, make sure that when you ask your questions and you kind of do your normal nature journaling processes, that you're not just taking for granted um, this video and just sort of like absorbing it um, passively. And um, that's the, the last tip too, is just don't be passive. When you're consuming content online, it's easy to go instead of doing a nature journal page, it's easy just to watch a bunch of videos and just passively absorb them. So um, let's not do that. Um, let's try to be more engaged when we look at them. So Mike, how do you feel if we uh, look at another photo and, and do kind of another version of what we just did? Um, could I say something about, uh, I guess yeah. it's just generally uh, safety and, and dealing with volcanoes. There, there are two, yes. there, there are two main kinds there are the, the shield volcanoes that we talked about a little bit before. They tend to be long. They can they can be quite high also, like Hawaii, but they, they tend to be very, very large and long. And then there are the stratovolcanoes, the beautiful cone shapes. So Arenal will be one, and the, the, the wonderful ones we saw in the, in the Ecuador. Right? Like Cotopaxi? epoxy for example or the cascades mount shasta beautiful cones those are mm. the stratovolcanoes now those those things don't erupt all that often usually i mean they may erupt for decades and then stop for thousands of years the problem with the stratovolcanoes is that explosions can often be extremely explosive so if you feel like if, if you were around in 1980 and you walked up to Mount St. Helens when there were little earthquakes going on up there and thought, well, I'll, I'll do a little journaling, as uh, unfortunately a couple of people were kind of doing. There was a geologist mm -hmm. on station there who called it in, and that was his last phone call. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they can be kind of explosive, so be very careful and kind of sample the local expertise if you're in an area where a, a stratovolcano is going off because you, you may not want to be around there you may you may be better off seeing that from the drones uh, a few hundred miles Great. away the the, the yeah, shield volcanoes like what's going on at kilauea or at or at, at mount aloha they're usually not explosive and they're they're generally fairly safe you can't go swimming in it the lava is actually hotter yeah. typically but you usually don't have the explosions and things are pretty, people People usually know what they're going to do. There, there's going to be a flow here and it's gonna flow. It's not gonna show up somewhere else and they're not gonna be, they're usually not that many surprises. Anything can happen, of course, but mm -hmm. stratovolcanoes be, okay. be a little careful. Shield volcanoes like uh, on Pacific islands and so on, okay. 
It's okay to be up okay. Close. Very vi- see. This is this is a great this is a great piece of information. And I noticed one thing when I was just in Ecuador is uh, I remember reading a couple of descriptions of Cotopaxi where they said Cotopaxi is a dangerous volcano um, because it's a volcano and because it's so steep. And then it didn't go into anything about the explosive it didn't explain it in the succinct way that you just explained it and so i think what can happen is a lot of times there's not really um either the people that know what the deal is they don't know how to explain it or it somehow gets lost in translation and i think this is where nature journaling can can actually play a role and where you explaining it succinctly like that can be really helpful um could you correlate this uh the straddle volcano shield volcano spectrum with the um the viscosity because there there is a correlation right isn't that what, yeah. or a causal uh so so the shield volcanoes have lower silicon content which means the lava is uh much much more fluid flows much better which is why they spread out more they're also hotter i don't understand the chemistry well enough to know which is which is the driver here it might just be that silicon melts sooner but it's so filled with impurities it's just sticky or it might be an inherent property okay. of, of silicon but the the stratovolcanoes are higher silicon the lava uh cools to like andesite that probably that dark rock that we were looking at or lighter rock called rhyolite it's stickier doesn't flow very far a lot of times it doesn't flow at all uh you, you wind up with uh like uh big piles of foamy looking ash from it because it doesn't mm-hmm. re- it, it's so filled with with gases that can't escape that it the uh, uh, the the result is very strange so they're okay uh, so they're dangerous that as a result of that too these guys these so uh, these if i'm cones, home i'm not sure what those what those are right 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 where they, okay where so if are. i'm doing sort of a if I'm doing a simplified spectrum here from these strato volcanoes that are really steep to shield volcanoes mm-hmm. that are really flat, um, these steep ones have more silicon. They're more explosive, more dangerous, less predictable. They have m- more silicon and they're uh, more andesite and rhyolite. And then these shield volcanoes are hotter and less silicon. Is that correct? That's right. That's basalt. Those guys are almost are basalt. Very, okay. Mo- mostly basalt. Yeah. Okay, a so let's dark, just say that if you had if you had to really simplify this folks, just think of this on a spectrum from steep volcanoes to flat volcanoes. The steep ones are more sticky lava, they're more dangerous, they're more explosive, the lava doesn't flow easily and they're uh more silicon and that these flatter ones like the one that's going off in Hawaii right now are less explosive, less dangerous. They're hotter. They have less silicon and more basalt. So that would sort of be a, a little bit of a simplification. And let's look at some. Um, here, here. Let's have a question here from the audience. Ivea has a question about a term. Cinder cones. What about cinder cones? Okay. So uh, uh, cinder cones, cinder cones are everywhere. So uh, all, all volca- of all of, of the above ground uh, above sea volcanoes produce cinder cones um okay that's that's so all of the oops all of all of these are cinder cones those they look like they might be cinder cones and the they they might not really they might not be in the class of stratovolcanoes which are much larger cones so they they might be part of something else or they might be uh stratovolcanoes that just Baja is pretty old. That the, have just worn yeah. worn down. Okay, so cinder cones. The the terminology might be confusing, or there might be some overlap, but not necessarily. Cinder cone is not equivalent to stratovolcano. No, no. Okay. You'll you'll find you'll find cinder cones like we we saw them all over the Galapagos, right? So those are those are all shield volcanoes. And then when you go to the Cascades, there's cinder cones here and there around Mount Lassen. The, those are completely okay, cool. different volcanic, volcanic types. Yeah. And, All right. And so I don't have birds, a, a. Yeah. I don't have. Up? Unfortunately, I didn't get 
Yeah, that's a great, great. Thanks for that. I don't have a, um, I don't have any of the images of the volcanoes in the Galapagos pulled up right now, but um, I'm just going to show, uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to look at a couple things and do another little nature journaling exercise here. Um, so let me share my screen. And I will just show, um, here is a page that I did um, in Baja of some of those um, old volcanoes. And you can just see that here it's a landscape Ito. I, I did use um, text to write about it. And I also used some arrows and numbers to designate the, the different specific ones. So um, that is an approach. And we're going to look now um, at this volcano. Some of those, some of those were cinder oh. cones. That from that picture. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. I I, okay, I don't remember cool. which ones because it's it, you know it depends on which what made them and where it was. Okay. But I remember some of okay. them. Okay. All right. So now we're gonna look at this this spot. This here is in Ecuador, and this is uh, a volcan Pichincha, which I think you did a you did some research on, and supposedly this one has erupted. I think it covered Quito and Ash uh, uh, not that yeah. long ago. Um, but tell us, what do you see here? In, what can you read from this landscape? Well, it, I, I actually don't know for sure, but it, it looks like there, there are uh, heaped up structures that there might be like gigantic ash falls that have occurred here. And then, I guess I need to move my hand here. Then it looks like uh, water has come and carved out valleys or canyons through here. I'm not sure, though, because uh, I, okay. I kind of expect the orientation to be a little different. But Yeah. Uh, it, One thing I want to point out, everybody, is when you have someone that says that they're not sure or it depends, that is the person that you want to trust. When someone says, I know everything that's going on here with 100% confidence, that's the person you don't want to trust. So thank you, Mike, for uh, showing a true, true signs well, of I'll, someone I'll, who I'll actually... I bet there's an Ecuadorian volcanologist who could tell you everything you want, every, everything here and then some. I'll go, uh, but, I'll, but I'll go time, with you. But a lot of times this, 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 uh, this, this area lower down and further away from the volcano... Uh, a couple of things might have happened to produce it in the first place. So one thing that might have happened is a lot, a lot of ash fell, not 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 a lava flow, but a, a lot of just uh, ash and clinkers. It could, could be boulders as well, but it's not a not a solid or or not a a, a, a liquidy material that congeals into a, a big rock slab. So this is not very mm -hmm. turns into not very good rock, right? So it's easy for water to come coursing through here and carve out channels. The other thing that can happen, and I'm not sure about Pachincha, it might not be high enough. The, the volcano can have a glacier sitting on top of it. This hasn't exploded in 10,000 years. Nothing's happened. It's built up a massive amount of ice and snow. It's like Mount Rainier in, in Washington mm -hmm. State. And then things heat up, and it blows all that stuff off. Well, what happens then? There, there's an enormous flood mm. of water that courses down the side of the, the, the mountain and tears everything loose with it. Enormous amounts of mm. soil and rock and mud. So you could have huge layers okay. of like avalanche slide or mud here, which is also mm. not very good rock. And so, you know, as the things stabilize, then a river can come and cut its way through. So then you have all these valleys and channels. I was seeing quite a bit of that in yeah. Quito when we were driving around, but I wasn't really absolutely able to look at it in depth. So very interesting. So potentially some of the previous, um, you know, maybe in in past millennia, like during the Pleistocene, when this area would have been colder, there could have been more ice. Frost frost yeah. does occur. We saw frost several times on Pichincha while I was in this location, but. Yeah potentially in the past, like during the Pleistocene, there could have been ice here and there could have been dramatic floods is what you're, it, what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, almost okay. certainly. Yeah, the erosion part is very interesting. And uh, what sort of nature drilling techniques do you think would be good in this kind of situation when you're, when you're this far from a, a volcano? 
well, if, if I wanted, if I, if I knew that there had been a flow, I, I might want, might want to try to show that, that uh, maybe like at, at Mount Lassen, say, where there's a, a, a lot of detailed history, people will know that the, the, let's see if I can get my finger here. People will know that the volcano currently looks like this, but mm -hmm. it used to look like this. It used to be an immensely bigger uh, mountain that has blown up. So I, I might want to show that, or I might I might not know that much, but I might be able to recognize, oh, this is a this is a huge flow of some kind of mud or material. So I might be able to, if I can recognize it under the vegetation, I might be able to draw that in. Or great. So know, maybe we could do, the, maybe we could could look at sort of some research or or sort of maps or. Um, generated of this area or mike do you remember that um aerial photo at that one location we were looking at that lava um in in near antisana when we were going up to see the condors and we kept wondering like what's going on what's going on and then when we got to that place for lunch yeah. they had the aerial map and suddenly it all right. clicked because we could see the way the lava flowed right right and that that was a uh a pretty that 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 was some pretty interesting lava too that that might have been a, a big rhyolite flow which is unusual because it was a okay so maybe color. we could create a diagram maybe we could create a diagram using information not just what we're seeing firsthand but sort of piecing together stuff from um some research too is what you're saying that's right a lot of times like in like in this picture here you know we have we have some shapes we we, we can see that something has gone on but it's an it's uh it's a natural environment that there's a lot of rain there's probably been thousands yes. of years since a big explosion and so what happens in the tropics there's an explosion of life because uh volcanic soils once they break down have a tremendous amount of uh, nutrient capability much better than sand than, than a pure yeah. beach sand so so yeah i talked about that in the r and all video a little bit so the vegetation can really take over. So we really can't see the rocks underneath usually. Uh, we were very lucky in the yeah. Galapagos that there's no water. So Absolutely. there's, you know, we, we can see everything and it stays that way. But here we, yeah. here we have to either infer it, we have to do our own research, or we have to rely on somebody else to tell us, well, this part over here is a, is a mud flow. And this part over here is, is, a, is a big uh, heap of ash that occurred 500 years ago. And this is... Or, or uh, what was the name of the valley that we went to um, our first day uh, in Ecuador? Whereas we were going uh, up to the lodge. Remember that there was a, a beautiful. Yeah, lodge? I do remember that. Yeah, a, fair, a famous uh, place. I can't remember the name. The name. The right now. Yeah. I, so if, there, if there I, you could. If I had that journal. I would know. Yeah, there you could actually. Uh, people can tell you where the flows were because they're they're not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was really interesting. Thanks for pointing out the effect that all of, of all these things that can happen afterwards and, and you know, how much rain and uh, vegetation um, affects it. That's really interesting. I'm going to show the page that I, I made um, from this. I basically just did a landscape ito. Um, I do have a bunch of questions in here and I do have a diagram showing um, the soil here, which I'm going to show you a, a short video of in a second. But um, there's topsoil and then there's this there's this really thick layer of sand and you can see in my questions here i asked a lot of questions about that and i have emailed mike um, some of those questions so i'm going to show you a little video here showing that soil and, and see see what you think and um we can sort of in our nature journal we can track um, these historic events So when I when I went to this spot, um, the the person that I was staying with told me that there was just alternating layers of soil and sand, and he he just said volcanic sand and kind of um, suggested that the sand was like shooting out of the volcano. So I was in my mind imagining these as sort of depositional layers occurring from the um, something shooting out of the volcano. But then after talking to you, it sounds more like uh, sand is almost always a, a, a product of erosion. Is that correct? Yeah, I would, I would think so. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so this isn't like a huge lip. Yeah. Right. Right. So this isn't just like some thick layer that got like there was a pyroclastic flow or some explosion and all of this stuff got shot out of the volcano and they just landed on I, all the land around there. I don't know. That 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 could be a that could be an ash fall. It's really hard to tell. Okay. It's, it's really hard. And, so and what fact, is the, the difference between, between ash kind of, and sand? Yeah, it it, it 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 could be difficult to do because <clears throat> because uh you know, sand is defined by particle size mainly. Oh, and, that's and, right. You know, there's these like grade, gradient, uh, gradients of sand, and, and and it's not a, it's not exactly a technical term. It's not exactly not either. It, it's uh, uh, usually uh, like like you can have a, a a sand that's based on coral. So most of most of the material right, the right. is that white, bright white, yes, uh, crushed crushed calcium. So, okay, so this is really great. What Mike is pointing out is that um, sand is, uh, and I think sand silt and clay are all um, terms that refer to particle size, not right. like the composition of the thing. Thank you so much for reminding me of that. I knew that somewhere deep in in my head. So thank you for 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 pointing that out. So. Um, this question from Susan then, um, you know, is uh, what, do, what do you think about this, this thing, this sort of idea that she's, she's sharing here? So, so that, mater that material would be uh, uh, ash, tephra, the, the, the ash is a subset of tephra usually. The, the material that, that's blown out of a, a, an exploding volcano, like a stratovolcano, <clears throat> there was too much trapped gas for it to congeal into a nice liquidy material. So instead it, it exploded or it just was projected out by the gas expanding and leaving the volcano. Mm -hmm. So it okay. would, I, I just don't think people would call it sand. I think they would want it to go through a, some processing before, before they called it that. It, yeah. It, it, this it felt like, water. this felt like sand. This totally felt like sand to me. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, it felt very high um, quartz or very high uh, silica, silicon to me um, when when I touched it. So in yeah. my head, I've been ever since I was there, I've been trying to wrap my head around what exactly that sand was, how that came out of a volcano. Um, so I, I think that I'm I'm getting so, there. And also just so a what reminder are the that our nature are... journal pages don't have to be answers. We can stay with the open questions yeah i i think it's a really good question I, I really am not i don't have a firm understanding of the difference between them it seems like sand comes up in the context of it of uh, some further processing that's taking place with the rock like why right. wouldn't ash okay. be, be called sand after it's right sat on the mountainside for a while and then been washed down by a flood okay. you know that's it's the same right, right. chemically it's the same material it goes through a little bit more uh, abrasion and beating, you know, as it's tumbled in, right. in, a, in, a, in a mud flow or in a stream or even in the ocean. But it's, it's chemically yeah. the same material. So, okay, uh, this, cool. so, All so right. this, 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 this could be a, uh, this could be sand that, that was knocked off that uh, volcano very gently over hundreds of years by rivers flowing by water flowing past, slowly eroding the rocks or carrying down uh, freeze-thaw uh, fragments uh, from the mountaintop and Absolutely. tumbling them and building them up. Or it could have come all at once, a gigantic mud flow, bam, laid right. down 10 feet of mud on top of topsoil, on top of a you know a previous incarnation of a uh, beautiful green valley, now buried. All right, cool. Thank you so much for, for um, doing that. So let's kind of go into the final stage here and and say, like, do you think, is this just me that thinks that, um, you know, like when that volcano was, when when there was some uh, lava on the surface, I guess lava on the surface is kind of uh, uh, by definition on the surface, but when, when there was some activity in Iceland and people were flying over there and taking photos and 
you know, I saw it on Instagram. I was like posting on Instagram, like, wow, we, how can we get a nature journaler over there? Um, and now it's happening again in um, Hawaii. And I'm thinking, how can I either go myself or um, get someone else to go over there? Is it just me? Am I totally biased? Or do you also think that, I mean, you're, you might be slightly biased as well, but like if we've got all kinds of photographers, we've got people with drones, we've got people writing articles about it. Um, you know, we've got people, Instagram influencers taking selfies with lava. Don't you think like it would be cool to have some nature journalers on location at some of these events? Well, yeah, there, there, uh, there are things that you can, you can document that the, the cameras are not, they are going to struggle to do with a camera. You have to, you have to be there and mm -hmm. take so many different kinds of photographs. So you can rely, for, mm -hmm. for example, if you know a place already, you can rely on your memory of it. So you, mm -hmm. you can construct some, you, you can construct some story out of it. You could project into the future. What is this going to look like, mm. you know, 50 years from now? or 150 years from now. There's a lot of precedent for that. You know, Krakatoa blew up and mm -hmm. people were watching that that volcano like uh, reestablish life. Yes, uh, I love those studies. Right. Uh, and this, to some extent, you can see that in, uh, in, in uh, uh, at Mount St. Helens. So you could, you could use your imagination that, you know, camera mm -hmm. doesn't have any imagination. You know, or you mm -hmm. can use that material too, you can, because they can see things that you can't, right? From their drone, you you can see the, right. the layout of uh, of a lava flow, say, or of the layout of a mud flow. But you can also mm -hmm. like, you know, this is what it looked like thirty seconds before this happened. This is what it's going to look like in a hundred days after the right comes. You know, you can do you can do things that that uh, photographers and uh, uh, geology science, geologists can't do well, from measurements that exist right now. You could show um, okay. you can show some projection of what's uh, of, of what's going on too that that are possible right. but difficult to do with uh, with pictures. Okay, so right now this is um, this this live stream is on YouTube. It's on the Facebook Nature Journal Club, and it's also on my LinkedIn. So if there's, you know, some scientists or researchers on LinkedIn who just happen upon my LinkedIn profile and they see this, how can we convince people like that, like volcanologists or people from like National Geographic who are paying, they probably pay these photographers and drone pilots, I think probably have a pretty big budget um, compared to the, the materials needed for nature journaling. How can we convince people like that? Uh, of the benefits of having a, a nature journaler on the team. Hmm. So, I I think the, the, I think I would come back to storytelling. It, the the, uh, the volcanoes are um, a one of the few geologic processes that happens in, in inside human lifespans you know we don't see continents colliding we don't see um, we, we we see earthquakes but we don't we don't see like tectonic shifts which are really important but we just it's we only live 100 years maybe and some of these processes take tens of thousands of years before they they, they really make an impact so i think uh, but but even even with even with that vo vo volcanoes are pushing it the effects of an of, of an eruption take decades, so we, we can tell stories about what's happening that aren't available that, that are right at the edge of what's available. So you, you can you can make predictions about what's going on, or you could um, you could uh, tell a story about what was here, what what's happened in the in the eruption, and what's going to be here after the eruption is over. I, I you know I keep coming back to that. I think that's an interesting thing that. The documentarians can't really do. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that time scale piece, Michael. And I was just over here writing that down because I love that concept that the, the volcanoes are one of the few geological processes that we can tell stories about on our own time scale. And I, I think that's just a really, a really poignant way to sort of wrap up here. 
Uh, is there anything else that you feel like we didn't uh, talk about that you think is, is really relevant in this sort of conversation of, I mean, and I told you what my goal is here. My goal is as usual to sort of advance the um, conversations in the nature journaling community. And in this particular case, advance the conversation around um, geology, abiotic um, um, processes and, and volcanoes. Like what are the questions what are the sort of uh, frameworks that nature journalers need to sort of advance a conversation about um, volcanoes and geology? So is there anything that we didn't, you don't feel like we didn't cover um, that I, for, I forgot to um, yeah. bring up or ask? Well, they're big subjects that they wouldn't fit inside the time we have. There are two, there are two that I can think of. The, the first one is the, the effect that these have on climate. And, and there are multiple mm. dimensions here. So these, these enormous volcanoes stick up up in the air and they affect uh, wind currents and they affect rainfall. They have immense effects. And the other thing is a huge amount of gas comes up and out of these volcanoes. Lots and lots of carbon dioxide, lots and lots of water and other stuff. So all that has, that has had and will have huge climatic effects uh, uh, on the earth. The explosions that we've seen have had some effect, but not, you know, not, not enormous. But in the past, some volcanic eruptions have wiped out 90% of the life on earth. So uh, they're, they're, they're worth paying, you know, this process is worth paying attention to. It's made a big, uh, a big difference in how the earth works. The other thing that we didn't pay any attention, we, did, we didn't get to really is, why are there these volcanoes? Why are they there? What are they, you know, why, why do we have one kind over here and we have this other kind over here? And what, what's going on? What are the processes there? This is, a, this is something that's really, really slow, you know, beyond our, our lifespans, but it's fascinating. You know, why, why do we have, in, in Ecuador, why do we have one kind of volcano on the mainland and one completely different kind of volcano out in the Galapagos? Mm. So, you know, what's, What's going on there? And they're they're big questions, and they have a lot of they have a lot of relationship to how the earth, how we think the earth works, what, or what we know about what the mm. earth, how the earth works, and what what we don't know about how the earth works. Mm. Yay! I'm so glad I asked that final question. That's always um, that's the most wise question that i've added to my list of um questions because it's um the things that i i don't think of asking people so um thanks for sharing those and i'm i'm really glad you there, mentioned the climate great one. people to talk about things like that too as uh, both the climate side and the this incredible you know the incredible story of this amazing planet that we're on which may may be unique you know maybe the only one probably the only one in the solar system that, that's behaving this way. It's got all this like, yes. liveliness in its geology. So I did read a book. Uh, I, I did read a book um, about geol uh, earth sciences and it, um, it had some sort of calculations about what's the likelihood of, um, you know, other planets with life, blah, blah, blah. And um, the, the fact that we have um, the, the, the level of geologic activity that we do with like moving plates and all this is um, one of the factors that makes makes our planet super unique and is potentially one of the factors a, a potentially prerequisite for um, they they haven't found any other thanks James for pointing this out that I, I don't think they have found any other planets that have anything on, like it so um, thanks for pointing that out as well Mike. Mike, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, and I should just point out here, I usually forget to do this, but um, um, Mike is one of my Patreons. And this is the main way that um, I support the work that I do. And I'm bad at self-promotion, but, uh, and I don't really sell very many things. I don't sell like, you know, watercolor supplies or anything like that on my website. The main thing that I do is I'm trying to advance the conversation, advance um, the practical ways that we can use nature journaling. So the cutting edge of nature journaling in a month from now, I'm going to be learning how to climb up into the rainforest canopy because I want to nature journal up there right now. I'm trying to help you or other people nature journal at active volcanoes. 
So I'm trying to advance the, the way that we use nature journaling and um, advance the ways that nature journaling can be used in applied ways. So if you want to help that mission, and this is what I do full time, it doesn't really pay that well. Um, but if you want to advance that mission, check out my um, Patreon. Um, there's also a lot of cool people there and cool benefits. But the main idea is advancing uh, nature journaling in applied ways. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. I think this was really fun. And I think um, this is an important topic. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, everyone, for, jo for joining right. in. Um, and for those of you who watch it afterwards, the recorded version. Uh, I'll see you uh, next week. Bye.